I just don't. I, uh, this is above my pay grade. No, it's not. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> uh, John. Do you know why we didn't define necessary? Because I'm looking at the California statute, which this is modeled after, and they did define the word necessary. Did they define it in the introduced version or the as? Yeah, no, I'm doing actually a compare version. So compare between the introduced. At least in the introduced. I mean, the introduced California bill. Yeah. Um, so it did not wind up in the version as passed by California. The definition of you necessary. Know, I mean, but why not define it necessary? I don't know why they didn't wind up defining it. My understanding of that bill is that it was introduced in a way that um, got a lot of uh, pushback, and it was, went through a lot of. Um, I think that it lost a lot of support along the way, and it um, marginally, I don't think it was ever fully supported by law enforcement. I think they didn't oppose it by the time it passed. Um, Can you help to define necessary? I think that it would. In the um, statute or in the bill, I should say? Just like any time you define something, it leaves it uh, in the hands of the legislature as opposed to um, letting the court decide. I think if you, are, if you do not define something, you're essentially leaving it up to the courts to decide what it means. Right. Okay. Go ahead. They're more qualified than they are. Uh, I don't know about that, but I mean, <laughs> but if you do define a term, I mean, it limits what a court can do in reviewing that term. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just don't define it, it allows them to interpret it. Right, as long as it's constitutional. Yeah. <laughs> so since the intent of this bill I think was was to draw um, to, to draw out the conversation around interactions between law enforcement and people in mental health crisis um, and necessary in the defense of human life does that also include um, the life of the person who's having the confrontation with law enforcement I would think so I mean I think that's yeah. how it's phrased yes so I'm wondering if, if there's anything about this that meaningfully changes the interaction when someone is threatening suicide and whether law enforcement feels the need to use deadly force to preserve human life. That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I take it that you mean use deadly force against a person who is threatening suicide? That person. Mm -hmm. I struggle to see how that would uh, how that would preserve a law enforcement officer's. Um, I think that if a person is is threatening suicide and a law enforcement officer, I don't think that I don't think anything about that language would direct a law enforcement officer to take a person's life to prevent them from committing suicide. Maybe I'm not understanding. Would just would would there? be the equal justification of that choice to use deadly force, even if the threat to human life was the suspect threatening their own life. Right. Um, I imagine it might, it may, um, it may lead to um, law enforcement needing certain trainings about how to manage that, um, those kinds of interactions. If, if the subject was threatening suicide, was holding one or more hostages, threatening them as well, I could see it coming into play mm -hmm. then, certainly. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, well, people can threaten to commit suicide themselves, but it's where they point the gun in the end. It makes a difference on what the officer has to do, I think. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's my understanding that the, the standard and the thresholds that we have now have been deemed to be constitutionally correct and in line even without going down this 
it's a grow. it's a le it's a constitutional standard. The legal standard is a constitutional one, so it's been developed by the by the courts. Yes. And the current standard that we're using currently has proven that to be right. 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 In Vermont, it's also whether or not uh, law enforcement's actions were objectively reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. will not be back until 1.45. And so um, there are a couple other witnesses who I don't believe have uh, presented themselves yet. Um, Jacob and Rachel, do you? I, I emailed them earlier to see if they would be willing to even call in. Mm -hmm. So then go through you to make those arrangements. Okay. okay. Um, so, Michael Sherling, are you able to join us and answer a few questions about how Absolutely. this would change things from your perspective? Um, it, uh, do you want me to move out of the way? No, let's, let's hear from you first. Uh, for the record, Mike Sherling, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety. It, each time I come, there's a, another set of testimonies, so there's a larger context of things to respond to. Um, what I don't know at this stage is, what's is the goal to reduce the number of encounters that end fatally with police, or what what's the end game? I mean, obviously that's our end game every day. So the goal is to do that through policy. Uh, this is not going to do that. Um, this isn't going to change anything except the litigation landscape. Um, we will not know, if you pass a law around use of, force, use of deadly force, we will not know for the better part of a decade what the actual impact of that law is because we will spend millions of dollars litigating uh, each one of these events on the chance that plaintiff's counsel can win money uh, as a result because we won't know how to define the terms even if you define the terms. Um, That's, it, it, I should back up another step. <clears throat> On topics of criminal justice and law enforcement, I would challenge you to find <coughs> someone who's more progressive with a small P than I am. I'm willing to try anything to improve operations to get a better result for the taxpayer, get a better result for the organizations I've worked within. Um, but I, uh, this is uh, a construct that I have a hard time wrapping my head around. It's a system that is <coughs> not broken. Um, the, by that I mean the, the construct within which we operate relative to the use of force. The outcomes, we are always looking for better outcomes. But I would submit that, as I testified in part in the joint session, what is broken in the systems is something else. We have folks that we are encountering who are in far deeper crisis that face far greater challenges than we ever have in the past, and that is leading to worse and worse outcomes. Despite the fact that we keep increasing training, we keep increasing the tools available, the physical tools available to law enforcement officers, um, we keep increasing the number of officers we're able to, to place at a particular scene, and the results continue to be poor because the other side of the equation we have not touched. We have not created a good mental health construct. We keep eroding the efficiency and the efficacy of the criminal justice system. We keep eroding accountability. Uh, and frankly, we're dealing with folks that in many instances are suicidal. And if you look at a cross-section of, of these fatal encounters, they're looking for a way to end their own lives. What you're not looking at uh, when we enter these conversations is the, thou or the thousands of events that happen every year that are successful. It's the four or five or six that happen every year that are unsuccessful. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, that's pu fully public knowledge because um, Seven Days uh, wrote about it, but it's about a gentleman named Mohammed Saeed 
Uh, he was a new American in Burlington who suffered with protracted, um, repetitive mental illness. And it was so substantial that he didn't do what we often see, which is repetitive calls for help, claiming they're going to do something or asking for assistance. He just walked to the Winooski River Bridge and jumped in. And he was saved, brought to the hospital. Uh, we held on to him. We, the, the collective system, held on to him for a period of several days after which he was no longer a danger to himself, so he was let go. Two weeks later, he had a new apartment on Riverside Avenue. He called the police and was very overt in what he said was going to happen. He was going to force the police to shoot him. He was going to come out with a gun. He asked that we apologize to the officers and their families for what he was going to force them to do. Uh, the nature of the response, because we knew exactly what we were walking into, was completely different than the unknown, which is typical of what was going to happen. Um, so the scene was very well lit. He stayed on the phone with crisis negotiators for a period of time, and he eventually emerged from his front door with what he claimed was going to be a firearm, but because it was nighttime and the scene was so well lit, we could see it was a cell phone. So he was not shot. He wasn't shot with a beanbag. He wasn't tased. He was just taken into custody without any significant effort because we were able to see that it was a ploy to get law enforcement to kill him. <laughs> so we drive him to the hospital again. He spends two weeks at the hospital. He's now made two as overt as they can be efforts at taking his own life, one using law enforcement as the instrumentality of that effort. And two weeks later, he is back out, and we didn't hear from him for a period of time until, uh, I think it was about two months later, to, this is going back a few years now, but the neighbors um, in his new apartment began to smell something that didn't seem right. He had finally actually taken the action, he found a way, um, and it was uh, his body that was found rather than being fished out of the river or um, being saved as a result of a law enforcement response. There is a significant cross-section of the events that end fatally in encounters with police that are suicide. If you t were to take those out of this equation, you can count on one hand, typically far less than one hand, the number of fatal encounters with law enforcement in Vermont in any given year. Now, one is too many, but we are putting training, policy, hiring practice, supervision, data collection, new tools. We're investing millions of dollars every year in trying to find better outcomes, uh, changing the constitutional standard that has stood the test of time uh, is not the answer. It is only going to lead to similar bad outcomes, but much higher price tag for uh, Vermont taxpayers as a result. All that said, I have a variety of uh, information on the constitutional standard as sort of a uh, base of training to give you some sense of how this actually works. Um, the overview of the constitutional standard was good, but it's a fraction of 1% of what we actually train and what the various case law actually says. It is incredibly robust in its guidance. Um, at the highest level, uh, so I should stop and if there are questions, I'll take those, but if not, I'll sort of walk you through how we operationalize this standard. Um, so I'll admit, um, I've probably watched too much mainstream TV, and uh, in doing so, uh, you know, watched events, you know, television shows with the police involved, and thinking in a situation that might have taken place here in Vermont, why didn't they just, you know, shoot him in the shoulder, or <coughs> kneecap, or, you know, um... Shoot the gun out of his hand. <laughs> maybe not to that extent, but instead of going for the body mass, which I'm not sure you, you can probably address this, is that the training, or...? It is, uh, and the reason is simple. It's human physiology. Our uh, a sharpshooters, if they were a sharpshooter's ability to hit a small target, um, is pretty limited to say nothing of a handgun which has a very short barrel. Police officers are reasonable shots but the, the premise that we employ these you know tactical operators who are going to be shooting the apples off, apples off people's heads is not reality. Now, there are a couple that are like that but for the most part that's not the case. Um, 
so it is always the center of visible mass. We are shooting to stop. Um, you often hear in the movies and television shows, it's shoot to kill. That is absolutely not the case. It is, you're shooting for the center of visible mass to stop whatever the harmful action that is occurring from occurring. Now, the center of visible mass may be a leg. If someone is what we call bladed, they're around a corner and they keep taking shots at you, but they've exposed a leg, you're going to shoot for the center of visible mass. You're shooting for the leg. But if they're standing in a standard three-point stance about to fire a weapon at you or they're coming at you with a baseball bat or a knife or they're pretending or really taking a weapon from in back of them, these things occasionally happen where they're doing this and there isn't anything there except a cell phone or a wallet. Um, but based on the circumstances, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second, there's a, a, a shot or more fired. Um, it's always the center of visible mass to stop the action. It's not for any other reason. It's trying to stop what's happening. Okay. I was just going to say, on that topic, so you, you, this motion that sometimes you'll see in uh, news coverage of these events, typically knock on wood outside in Vermont, um, one of this, the way, this is not a constitutional structure, but one of the ways we have historically trained on this topic is to use a, tr a triangle called ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. So how do you determine objectively whether the person that you're facing poses a risk of death or serious bodily injury to the officer, to another person, or to themselves? And then what is the standard of force that you can use as a result of that? So ability, opportunity, or jeopardy. Do they have the ability to cause death or serious bodily injury to uh, you or to another person? Are they carrying a, a knife, a, uh, a gun, a baseball bat, uh, another implement that could do that? Do they have the opportunity? So are they within range? If they have a knife and they're 60 feet away, they don't have the opportunity to pose that threat. And then the third piece is have they, uh, is there jeopardy? So it might be someone walking down, we used to deal with this with some frequency in Burlington, someone who's carrying an AR-15 down the middle of Church Street. They have the opportunity, they have the ability, but there is no jeopardy. They haven't done anything to indicate they're a danger. But if they were to unsling that weapon and say, I'm going to kill you, you're now justified in using lethal force, which typically is a firearm, but it should be noted that in this construct of, uh, of law that we've been given by the courts over the years, it could be a vehicle, it could be a flashlight, it could be a radio, it could be anything that we can use to stop someone that has a likelihood of causing death or serious bodily injury under the circumstances. That would be legal under that objective standard. So ability, opportunity, jeopardy. Do they have the, the ability? Do they have the opportunity? Have they done something that places you in jeopardy? It's not always in the moment either. It is, the use uh, domestic violence has been a, a, a topic uh, on another bill for the last couple of weeks. Uh, let's say John Smith ha is in, has just tried to break into his girlfriend's house. He's fleeing, screaming, I'm going to kill you. He's got a weapon. Uh, he's got a firearm. We'll make it easy. Um, it gets more interesting if he's got the, you know, the type of weapon he's got. Um, that objective standard becomes more and more complicated, right? Uh, he's got that weapon. He has indicating he's coming back to kill her. Can we shoot him? Can we shoot him in the back as he's running away? It depends on the circumstances. But based on the very simple construct I've just given you, we are likely justified in shooting him in the back to stop that action to prevent him from coming back and carrying out something that could cause death or serious bodily injury to another person. All of those examples are fragments of why if you change the standard, we won't even have the ability to train on this because we will not know, even if you define certain terms, there'll be no way to know how the courts are going to interpret those things. And because use of force for everything else remains a Fourth Amendment constitutional construct, we'll actually end up with two different standards. We'll have a standard for the use of force in everything else, and we'll have a standard for the use of deadly force, and we'll now have to train 1,100 full-time law enforcement officers and hundreds of others how to use two different systems. 
That's not a suggestion that you take this construct and place it onto the rest of use of force because that gets even more complicated. Uh, I feel like I should take a break because that was all like one long breath because there's so much information and I'm fearful I'm going to run out of time. Um, what else would be useful? Questions, committee? At what point do officers decide that using a firearm is the best weapon versus something else like a taser or a bag or, or whatever, another means of force that is not lethal? It's a great question, and there's a million variables to that, and it depends on the circumstances. So are you in Burlington or South Burlington or Winooski where we can put multiple officers at the scene at the same time? Or are you in Essex County where the single Essex County Sheriff or the single trooper is going to be there for 45 minutes on their own? And it's based on what's the best information you have at any given moment in time. Do you know that the su subject is presenting uh, an object or weapon that might cause death or serious bodily injury? In that case, there, we're not... There's no need to progress. The, the standard of the use of force is there is no need to always progress from verbal commands through all the various layers. The there's been all kinds of different training models. The continuum, the ladder. Uh, right now, I believe it's a continuum we're training. Um, you don't have to progress and, and hit each different section before you get to the ability to deploy lethal force because you may not be able to do that. Now that said, if we can put five officers at a scene, or if we're controlling the circumstances, we're going through a doorway where we believe there may be a threat on the other side, we can script it so that we have multiple options. So it is not uncommon to go through that doorway with an officer with a can of pepper spray, an officer with a taser, an officer with a beanbag shotgun, and an officer with lethal option. And then be able to escalate almost instantaneously depending on the threat that you face. And those, are, those things are based on uh, the temporal um, overlay of the event you're responding to, how, how much can you slow down that event, and how many resources you can put there uh, at any given time. We also use, um, in the 21st century, a completely other operating methodology, which is leave. 20 years ago, that was not an option. Um, and we still face risks in, the, in making that decision today. Because we get sued when we do something, and we get sued when we don't do something. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter. There, there's litigation for everything in the world of law enforcement. So what I mean by that is, if a subject today is threatening to harm themselves, and they're alone behind a closed door in their house, there is a likelihood we're just going to walk away and let the chips fall where they may, and not introduce a threat uh, on our own or a weapon on our own if we don't know if the person's armed maybe we do know the person's armed why introduce uh, an escalation when you don't have to it doesn't always work that way there may be circumstances again the reason that this is an objectively fluid standard is the, the courts set it up this way very intentionally so that the courts can look on a case-by-case -case basis and judge the objectivity of the totality of the circumstances because you cannot script all of the variables and the possibilities. And when you look retroactively, as the current uh, version of 808 actually would suggest, to look at the officer's conduct, there's, there's no temporal overlay to that. So the officer chose to respond. Are we now going to be sued because we chose to respond to an event that, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, someone says, well, you just shouldn't have gone? Well, I could say that about 70% of the things that we go to, but we don't have an option. The moment someone says to us, you can stop responding when people call, we can have a whole different conversation. But there is, that, that is not the standard in contemporary policing. The buck stops with 911 and getting a police officer for pretty much anything. We, there are some things we, like I said, will back out of those suicide events. We've started to tell people no to other kinds of things. They'll call and say, uh, my 10-year-old won't go to school. Can you help me get them to go to school? We don't do that for the most part anymore. It depends on the circumstances. But you would be amazed at the types of things 
that people are calling for assistance with. And the moment we can stop responding to some of those things, you're gonna change the outcomes on a variety of things, so which goes back to my initial premise, which is this is a systems problem. If we build systems that create reproducible results, that deliver services at the right time, with a combination of compassion, treatment, and accountability, you're gonna get better outcomes. But right now, that's not what we're delivering, and we're vilifying police officers at the other end no matter what they do. It's doing too much or it's doing too little. And there is no way for a 25-year-old who we've trained 1,100 hours to be able to solve society's problems. We can't do it in a committee room. They can't do it in a snowstorm on the side of a highway. So what specifically in the system needs to be different in order to curtail this use of lethal force with suspects who are struggling with mental illness? First and foremost, uh, deliver a continuum of mental health uh, response that starts at the field level, uh, street outreach we call it in, in Burlington, uh, we, we call it embedded social workers in other places, but instead of getting a police officer to a mental health crisis, mm -hmm. you should be getting a crisis worker to a mental health crisis, unless the person already poses a risk. Mm -hmm. And then there, I think I started to talk about this, it, it's a piece of uh, testimony in a variety of different committees, but um, when someone needs a crisis bed, that bed needs to be available to them immediately. So they can access it, get whatever services they need, and then come back out. And then same, it, it, there are a variety of levels, but and, and there's no, I tend to look at it in four levels, but this isn't, you know, the, that's not the official system. Uh, when they need a bed that's more long-term, a, a placement bed, so that they can actually get treatment and not, and not be Mohammed Saeed, actually mm -hmm. just getting recycled back to the street, we need to be able to provide that bed. Um, we don't do that right now. Everything from what I call tier one, folks that need longer-term care who have such significant problems that they need help on an ongoing basis, cascade all the way through the rest of the levels of the system because we don't have the capacity. They wait in emergency departments for seven, eight, 10, 30, 40 days waiting for a bed. Uh, or they just leave and they end up dealing with law enforcement on the street. Or they end up hurt and they get in the back of an ambulance and end up back in the ER, but either way, it's a bad outcome. That's, that's where it starts. Um, it's about building capacity to respond using the correct instruments instead of everything falling to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna train our way out of this. We're not gonna equip our way out of this. And we're not going to create a statutory construct that's going to change it. it. When you're facing someone who's got that deep a crisis, you, you, you're not going to fix it in the moment. We could, at that moment, if we wait to that point, I can put a team of psychiatrists in front of them. It's not going to change the outcome. They've already decompensated so badly that you're not dealing with a rational actor. They're going to swing the machete at the psychiatrist as much as they're going to swing it at a police officer. You've got to deal with it early. It's a medical model. Prevent, do early intervention, find alternative uh, methods, and then do surgery if all else fails. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for coming here. I think highlighting the complexity of this. Um, being from Wyndham County, I've seen the benefits starting with what Keith Clark did in Bellows Falls and then as sheriff with social workers, and I just heard you talk about that. That was the first one in Vermont. <clears throat> yeah. And in that first year, I think arrests went down 50% in Bellows Falls because uh, she was able to diffuse situations before they got, got to the point of crisis. Um, one of the challenges is, and um, I see this in my work too, you can't force people into treatment. Even when they're facing the choices, you lose your children, you go into treatment, uh, they don't make the choice. And I would agree we need more embedded social workers. Do you have a number? I don't have a number because we have to, met, part of this goes to the data overlay that I've been talking about as well. Uh, We've got to met, do a better job of measuring the impact of mental health response and opiates and a variety of other things. So I, I don't want to get mired only in mental health. Um, but 
the data will inform that, and then the efficacy, <coughs> testing the efficacy, like you said, there's a, you, we know the model works because no matter where it's been deployed, you see a reduction in the number of contacts with those folks. You're saving the emergency department resources, you're saving ambulance service resources, you're saving fire safety resources, you're saving law enforcement resources, and you're getting better outcomes because you're putting the right thing at the scene at any given time. Um, the numbers, though, we won't know without, we don't have a statewide test, so that's what we're working toward now is deploy embedded social workers in as many barracks as possible this year, and that, uh, if I'm repeating myself, please let me know to be quiet, but we're, uh, the Department of Mental Health uh, Corrections and Public Safety are all going to co-invest in that uh, this year, and then we'll see what happens, and then we'll have a better sense of how much more we need to build going forward. Just to quickly follow up, um, Christine Bullock's one of the best we have in Westminster. Leave her there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to change it. If it works, if it works, we're not going to no, touch it. Sometimes when someone is good, they get kicked upstairs. Performance punishment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nelson? We're talking about police officers responding and people getting hurt in some way. How often does the, the police officer end up getting hurt in this state by the, when they respond to these calls? And you, see, you don't see it as much in the paper, but I know that one was shot down in Pondle years back. Uh, luckily, it's rare that uh, that police officers get shot, but here is the 2018 use of force data. So 223 events, unique events across 100 and almost 18,000 uh, unique events. Um, 30 times, this is just for state police, so 30 times officers were injured, 72 times um, subjects were injured. Um, you sort of expect that because we, we have a tool belt, and typically the subject doesn't. Most of the time, they're fighting by hand. It's not typically weapons. Um, so we have a variety of tools that um, they get sprayed with capstan or other implements, dogs. <laughs> so. Thirty. Yeah. So as far as backup goes, I draw from your conclusions that the underfunding of the Department of Mental Health and the diversion of those probably beneficial interactions to the Department of Corrections is not a medal earning ceremony here. And you just mentioned no. that Corrections Mental Health and public safety are coming together to put something together. Would it simply be better if we had a state hospital system again that had beds available? They're full now, they're deficient, they're underfunded. It would, it's gonna take a while to get there. Uh, and the, be, let me back up a couple steps. Well, when you back up, specifically go to the corrections piece, because I've been to the Rutland jail a couple times and not a mental health facility. Part of what's driving the 117,711 calls and the increase in fatal encounters and just the overall workload for law enforcement over the last 40 plus years is deinstitutionalization, which was the correct policy idea, poorly executed, and I say that lightly, not just in Vermont, this is a nationwide problem. It's a failed promise of, a, of, of alternative treatment methodology. We're going to treat you in the community. We're going to, the community's going to wrap around you. We're going to provide field supports. We're going to, we're going to reinvest the dollars we save um, from what used to be 1,100 people in the office building that we now occupy. Uh, that never happened. And we simply use the criminal justice system as the surrogate for a meaningful mental health system today. Um, talk to any county sheriff or corrections department anywhere in the country, and they'll tell you there's a cross-section of people in their facilities who belong in mental health treatment, not in jail. Uh, but that's not, the, that's not the way it works. The way it's operationalized over the years 
Um, so here's the field police officer view. When I started uh, 30 years ago, if someone posed a danger to themselves or others, that is the legal standard in Vermont for hospitalization, uh, just quick hospitalization to get an evaluation. The way that actually gets operationalized has eroded over time. It went from you're a danger to yourself or others, to you pose an imminent danger to yourself or others, to you've demonstrated a danger to yourself or others, you've harmed yourself, you've harmed someone else, to the Mohammed Saeed model, which is you've repeatedly demonstrated that you're a risk to yourself or others, and we still don't hospitalize you because we don't have the resources. That's how the two things intersect. So then what's the play out of the Woodside thing? We already don't have the option of corrections for juveniles. We're eliminating what has been an option. Mental health has no capacity to deal with them either. They go to a foster home, which is not the best thing unless they need to be detained, and then who knows what happens. What's the rollout of Woodside that's happening now? Small volume, um, moderate to high impact, so it's three or five kids a month, as I understand it, in, in recent years since the, uh, uh, the changes in the juvenile justice system that have been made. Um, so you need capacity for those folks, but you don't necessarily need a facility that's quite as large, so a little more nuanced uh, version, I think, is where AHS and, and Secretary Smith are headed uh, for that. Um, you need that capacity, but it is not high volume. It's not the mental health system where there is a there's a there's a volume that's higher than 25 or 50 out of 626,000 people that need more help than we can provide. And, and I I should be really clear that I am not in any way suggesting a that there should be a stigma that goes with having a mental illness, or b that we should be taking a large swath of the population to suffer from mental illness and finding hospital beds for them. We're talking about a relatively finite number of people, but they're super high impact. It's a couple of hundred people probably, but it's not 25, and it wasn't 50. The, the common misbelief is that Irene caused this. Irene did not cause this. We did not have capacity when we had 56 <coughs> beds in Waterbury. We were turning people away every single day because there was not capacity. And they were clear to, to any lay person, let alone trained professionals, they clearly needed more than we were able to provide. And, and the waiting times in the ERs were the same. There were 30, 40 days people were sitting in hallways waiting for beds. So, committee, I would like to switch gears, if that's possible, and we will definitely want to have more conversation with you as we continue our work on this. Um, but we have Julio Thompson with us right now for about 45 minutes, I understand. It's not going to take that long, but I, that's when I have to leave the committee room now. Gotcha. Well, please join us. and. Um, <clears throat> As I've said to other folks um, in the previous days that we've worked on these subjects, we're, we're um, relaying some issues out on the table to discuss um, around law enforcement interactions uh, that result in use of deadly force. Uh, so we're trying to separate out the different components of these bills, one of them being um, a desire to see better data collection so that we have better ability to analyze what's going on, um, another proposal to change policy, and uh, and yet another proposal to, uh, to do something in the way of training. And so I would leave to you to, to share with us your, uh, your thoughts on any of those issues. Uh, sure. So for the record, I'm Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Attorney General Civil Rights Unit. Um, <clears throat> By, by um, statute, the Attorney General's office is responsible for the training at the Vermont Police Academy um, uh, for the hate crimes uh, course, so um, talking about criminal and, and civil enforcement um, for hate crimes, and I've been the instructor uh, for that class uh, twice a year since, I think, uh, it might be in the spring of 2010. So I've, I've had a few uh, classes through there. That is uh, a class where we 
talk about issues um, relating to scene response. Uh, we talk about issues relating to bias, but it's not the only block in the academy, and it's never been, that deals with the issues of bias and those things. So uh, if you want to hear more about the hate crimes class and what we teach there, I can speak to that. We're responsible for it. Uh, approving and, and delivering the, the curriculum by law, but for the um, fair and impartial policing course, I do not uh, teach that, although I'm familiar with the state fair and impartial policing policy. Um, so I think we have, uh, we have some observations that we would offer on um, uh, the bills. I probably would prefer to start with H-464, if that's okay, because I think that some of the ideas that are advanced in there, I think if they were consistently implemented, and I don't have a view about how consistently the practices are implemented today, especially with uh, police agencies other than Vermont State Police, and state police leaders tell you what they do. Um, but the idea there about having uh, an emphasis or ensuring that there's uh, consistency, and I think a frequency in training officers on de-escalation, de uh, my experience is, is and, and this is from uh, more observation and, and work outside of Los Angeles. I worked on a lot of policing issues when I was in Los Angeles um, before I moved to Vermont. Um, I was a deputy monitor for the LA County Sheriff's Department for um, roughly 10 years um, and saw them change towards a de-escalation model. I think uh, Emphasizing, I think, also having performance expectations for de-escalation is the way, really, that you're going to likely have safer or even safer officers. You're likely to have less force use in the field without, I think, sacrificing law enforcement outcomes. Um, de-escalation, as I think the commissioner just said, is something that's taught already as part of tactics. So if you are the first officer to respond to a scene, there's someone at a bus stop, and they have what looks like a knife, at least that's the report uh, that's come in for the call. If you're the first person there, as a matter of just basic tactics, and I'm not a sworn officer, but, I, but just as I think common sense tactics is that if you exit your car and close the distance with that person, you may in yourself contribute to your own peril uh, because if it is an edge weapon, they, they're in a position to use it on you. De-escalation sort of emphasizes that uh, distance is your friend, especially if you're the only people on the scene, that barriers are your friend. So standing, placing a barrier between you, like your patrol car, um, using verbal commands, but may not only, may not resolve it finally, but often will buy the officer time. So if there are other officers on the way, um, they can have the, the superiority of numbers, which sometimes the superiority of numbers contributes to safer outcome, um, so that the officer can move to a more tactically safe position. It could be that they arrive in a place that's unsafe for the officer because they don't know where the threat is. It might be near water, or the person might be elevated or have some position of advantage. So there, uh, that's just several of many reasons why de-escalation, first and foremost, is in the officer's um, interest. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the, the question then becomes what happens, I think, from a policy standpoint. What other agencies outside the country, country have encountered, and I think in jurisdictions that are quite different than Vermont, uh, where there are very large police forces that are hard to train regularly. We have thousands of officers, and it's hard to train them regularly. But what happens when the officer disregards their training? So that they do something that everyone who's been through the academy agrees is tactically unsound, and the officer closes the gap and doesn't have a, a tactically or a, a, a sound reason for that. What is the consequence of that? Um, I think that that's some of the, from, um, uh, for many departments uh, nationally, there is no consequence. If an officer is, has someone about to stab him under the Fourth Amendment, that officer is going to be able to discharge his weapon to save his life. But the question becomes that police departments have to grapple with, and I think Vermont trains officers to grapple with this, is what happens when the officer contributes to the peril unnecessarily. 
Um, yeah, back in Los Angeles, they used to just call those lawful the awful. Um, doesn't invite, can't prosecute the officer, can't sue him under Section 1983. Um, but everyone who looks at it thinks it shouldn't have gone down that way. My, my perception or my experience is that the way agencies have turned that around uh, is not through statutory mandates um, because, frankly, when an officer is in the moment, um, they are in a high-stress situation, and if they are close to the subject, they may be having what could fairly be called a near-death experience. And a um, few of us have had that. I sometimes have taken my eye off the road and find myself swerving off, and you have that split second where it's like, whoa, right? Um, it's not something where I'd be thinking about what the vehicle code tells me I should be doing, but rather maybe what my own training when I had in training and experience would tell me what, what to do. Um, but the way that it's been addressed typically is through training and policy with performance expectations. So to have a consistency so that an agency says, if you're doing, so, you're doing something that's contrary to our tactics, there's a carjacker who stopped and everyone is setting up for you know, a high-risk a high risk vehicle stop, and then you just decide on your own you're going to disregard your training and run up to the window. You might only have a quarter second to see that what the person has is not a firearm but a cell phone. You might be justified in discharging your weapon. But the larger question from a policy standpoint is, what do we do with the officer who runs up to the, to the window when all of their training and maybe common sense tells us when they shouldn't do that. Um, I think that is, um, you know, for many departments in the United States, there is no section. Maybe they get more training, they don't get discharged, they don't get disciplined, they might not be reassigned because it's not a violation of any policy. The firearm, the use of force, which is the firearm discharge, is judged from the moment of the trigger pull, not the events that led up to it. So what we're seeing, I think, increasingly is we're seeing a separate obligation, a performance expectation that officers will de-escalate, de that they won't contribute to their own peril unless there's really no other feasible alternative, uh, so that you don't have unnecessary risks that the officers are doing that's contrary to their tactics. Um, <clears throat> and the way that's been done is basically through training uh, in conjunction with policy um, and uh, a philosophy that comes from, from the top of the organization down where we are going to be smarter and more deliberate whenever we can, when it, that's safe to do so, um, rather than rushing in and placing hands on when our training tells us that we shouldn't do that and that there would be some sort of consequence to that. Um, there really isn't a model for doing that legislatively. California was the first state to do that. Um, this past year, although I would point out that I'm not sure it's that big of a change for California as it might be for Vermont. Um, in 2013, uh, there was a, <clears throat> a federal lawsuit brought against the San Diego Police Department, a case called Hayes versus County of San Diego, where the officers were sued following a fatal shooting, not only for constitutional violations, but for common law negligence. And part of the analysis under California negligence law was looking at the actions of the officers prior to entering to contact with the sus suspect who was reportedly suicidal uh, and using deadly force. Um, so that had already before eight, uh, the California law had been passed. That was basically the governing law in California for um, better than half a decade. Um, so it's not that big of a change. Vermont, it's, it's, it's quite different. I, I can't say that I've done any statistical study. The types of shooting the other agencies can do that. But in terms of a, a, dealing with the problem of critical incidents um, from a broader spectrum, not just deadly force, that's such a small number of cases involving deadly force. And often the transition from a lower level of force to deadly force is almost instantaneous. Um, and so uh, agencies that have seen decreases in the use of force in a major department, decreases in officers being killed or shot at or stabbed or seriously injured, has followed that focus on 
uh, de-escalation training that's consistent, that's understandable, that's um, refreshable or it's refreshed, uh, and where the department's own policies will hold the officers accountable if they are in a position where they are, for no good reason, disregarding their own de-escalation policies or training. So I think that's where, uh, when you see success stories in cities like Seattle or New Orleans, um, it's a broader, separate approach to de-escalation. Uh, in Seattle, there's a separate policy for de-escalation. Uh, but more fundamentally, it's, um, it's a change or it's, it's um, uh, embracing that philosophy in, in Seattle. It had very, had, which was under a consent decree, still is um, just about to end a consent decree. But um, the way that Seattle turned it around in terms of the uses of force, the non deadly uses of force with individuals who were seeking to self harm or who were mentally ill, was de escalation, was slowing it down whenever possible, and use the superiority of numbers, and to emphasize to all of um, their members that. This was tactical, that this was not, you know, uh, going easy on the bad guy uh, or guys, but rather just sound tactics. Um, and I think their training, I mean, they changed it to tactical de-escalation. That's what the course is called. Um, and then they ran the officers through scenario-based training. We're in a safe environment. They're able to identify or, or to do an after exercise critique and say, well, you know, there was, you had a subject with a knife, and there was a kitchen, we put you in a kitchen, and there was a table there, and so, do you think maybe you could have put that, you know, stood where the table was between you, so if that person decided to rush you, then that would at least slow them down, so that if you need to retreat or, um, you know, use your weapon, or to get out of there, then you could do that. Um, but to do that in a realistic manner of training, rather than, you know, the death by PowerPoint that's been the bane of a lot of training and I think in adult learning in the United States. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about either of the bills or, or you know, to... Yes, so specifically on 464, I mean, I, yeah. you, one, is the bill necessary? Two, if it is, in your view, what would you recommend to <clears throat> change? Uh, I was asked to testify about this bill this morning, so I don't, I don't know that I could be the final word on whether it's necessary, because I couldn't tell you right now what um, the Criminal Justice Training Council requires in terms of officer certification for de-escalation. Okay. Um, in terms of the collection of use of force data, um, I don't know whether agencies, I mean, Vermont State Police is quite good about that. I'm not sure. Um, how hard that is really to collect. I mean, officers would be reporting to their superiors a use of force anyway. So it seems to me to be useful information, not only to know what, how often force is used, but the type of force that's used. And part of the bill, which I think is useful, is that the model on the bill, I think, calls for some sort of collaborative exercise to develop the standards. For example, some agencies count as a use of force for their data and their reporting pointing a firearm at somebody, not having it out at your side, but pointing it. They count that as a use of force. It may not be unjustified, but maybe it may be the only reasonable response, but they still count it because they want to know how often that happens uh, and, um, and if that requires any adjustment to their training. But all the departments don't count it as a use of force. So I think there would need to be some work on identifying what you would count as a use of force. If someone's getting out of the car and they're reluctant and you have their hand on the arm, um, you're not really jerking them out of the car. Some agencies won't count that as reportable force. If there's no complaint of, um, of misconduct, there's no injury or complaint of pain, other departments might count that. Um, so I think you would want to have some uniformity if you're going to have um, use of force reporting because I don't know whether you know a given sheriff's department is putting into the system numbers that the state police would. You'd want to have consistency. Um, and in terms of um, yeah, I think you definitely would want to have consistent training standards on de-escalation. But what they're doing now versus what this would call for, I, I don't know because I haven't examined it. 
questions committee. You were right. Well before 245. Yeah. That's always so. Uh, mm. Thank you for joining Thank you. us. Is there anyone else in the room who is here to testify on either of these issues? <laughs> or Commissioner Shirley, was there anything else that you didn't well, have a chance to talk about that you would like to? I didn't get to 464 at all. Wow. Do you want to do that now or? Yep, that would be great. <clears throat> receive ongoing training. What about some of the auxiliary uh, law enforcement people like Fish and Wildlife or River <clears throat> Control? Would they receive the type of training, this de-escalation training that we're talking about? Because I know that they're called in once in a while for a crisis situation. They would, but the details of that I would not uh, have off the top of my head. I would have to ask uh, those organizations for additional detail. Okay, thank you. Following up on that, uh, Marine and all the other sort of non full time ish, you still have auxiliaries? We do. VSP? Very different, though. Is there a, there a tier to certification? Can you do me a favor and identify oh, yourself? Oh, sorry, Matt Birmingham, the, the director of the state police. Thank you. Uh, The goals of 464, um, I think I would agree with the methodology to get there. Um, I think there's some alternate ways to get to the end game that's that's proposed here. And actually, uh, I would suggest we should go a little bit bigger. Um, and that it might not necessarily um, require legislation. But that said, um, Better data collection is at the core of our modernization strategy, not just on traffic stops or mental health, as we were uh, discussing a little while ago, but on all topics related to Vermont law enforcement, Vermont policing, and, and public safety more broadly, and, and the operations on a day-to-day -day basis. So we are actively working right now to try to locate, we're in the middle of an RFP process to, to select a computer-aided dispatch and records management system that, if we're successful, could be deployed statewide and act as a repository for that information, both a, an intake mechanism and a reporting mechanism for all responses statewide. The idea is that um, this is one of the things that I observe the state should be doing as a core support function for public safety operations throughout the state. And my hope is that we're able to find a way to do that at no cost to the agencies that would be using the system in exchange for a variety of things, including the ability to do statewide aggregated reporting on topics like uh, are addressed here in, in 464, but also many others, informing our conversations about mental health and opiates, crime in general, uh, informing what's head, what types of things are headed over to corrections and sort of the backdrop of, of that rather than just the, the sort of flat um, look at those things that historically has gone over in a paper uh, case file. So that's, that's data. Uh, model policy, uh, there should be a model policy on use of force which includes de-escalation. They exist in most departments in Vermont today. Um, however, in the last few weeks, we've engaged with uh, the Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association, um, the uh, Vermont Police Association, uh, and a, a host of other uh, players, the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, which exists to, in part, uh, inform you and, and the governor and, and myself on criminal justice policy with the idea that we adopt, we create and adopt a variety of model policies, not just on uh, use of force, fair and impartial policing, which exists now, but on other things up to and including hiring, vehicle operations, and a variety of other things. 
feedback on that concept is due this week, and the hope is that work will begin. Um, there's been universal acceptance of that idea that I've heard so far. I haven't heard anyone indicating that they're not uh, on board with that concept. Work would begin on those uh, immediately using the existing law enforcement advisory board as the, the, the center um, of that activity, but engaging stakeholders both within law enforcement and throughout uh, the state in communities, special interest groups, et cetera, on how to, uh, how to model those. Um, those policies again, not probably not a big lift because the models do exist in Vermont already. It's really about taking the best of all of them, putting them together, and uh, then disseminating them statewide for adoption. And candidly, one of the questions that's come up in the initial conversations about this is, well, what if there's uh, two or three or five departments that don't want to adopt them? Um, we've got some ideas on how to. Um, politely create carrots that would incentivize the adoption uh, that aren't quite ready for prime time, but we are thinking uh, along those lines about how to get people to uh, have 100% uptake on the what we have initially identified as the top six policies that should be universal. It should be noted that one of the reasons to have these policies be universal is not only to mirror best practice from place to place to place, but because not a day goes by when multiple departments aren't working together at a particular scene. So whether you're talking about driving or a use of force or de-escalation or some other key topic, search and seizure, they all should be using a policy that's, if not identical, pretty close so that there is not disparity with the way they're operating when they're standing next to each other. Uh, and then on the third piece, um, relative to reporting out uh, racial equity findings, not only in traffic stops, but across a much wider array, as I've been talking about, of, uh, of outcomes and data related to uh, operations, um, I think we ought to have that available to everyone, not just the director of racial equity or um, researchers, uh, the legislature, whether it's reports, uh, dashboards, raw data, it should all be available on a rolling basis. And I think one of the witnesses uh, last week talked about doing that on a much more rapid timeline, a 60 to 90 day timeline, and we concur wholeheartedly that we should be getting that data ready for publish, for being published not a year behind, but in as, as rapidly as possible, uh, probably a 90 day window to start with a hope that we could accelerate that um, as we get uh, more experience with whatever the new data system is to a 60 day window as quickly as possible. So. These are all directions that we are headed, uh, whether there is legislation or not. Um, and I think really the, the primary limiting factor in the legislation is we can go faster and we can do more uh, without having to chase a, a smaller cross-section of this through a piece of legislation. So perhaps I spent the last two years saying, no more reports, no more reports. We can't handle any more reports. This might be an interesting one that would lend itself to uh, report back in, in December on progress toward model policy data collection uh, on, a, on a bigger scale than has been envisioned initially. Was that a reflex? <laughs> <laughs> it was a reflex, sorry. Okay. I thought you were going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> you just woke up. Response, right. though. Um, any questions, committee? Oh, question. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, an appropriation for the data system that you would like in your budget? We do not because uh, what we are trying to do is simplify a variety of systems that are currently bolted together that don't yield particularly good results. They, they cause us to have to manipulate multiple systems. They have to have systems in between the systems to talk to each other. And then it's very difficult to get data out the back end of those systems. The hope is that we will be able to do this using the existing budgetary structure for multiple systems by collapsing them into one more nimble 21st century uh, data system. Um, I put a little asterisk next to it that if we fail at that, we may be back next year for uh, an appropriation, but we won't be coming back looking for millions of dollars. It would just be marginal if we can't thread the needle with the, uh, the money we've got. Yeah. 
So this is maybe a broad general question, but I wonder how well are we doing um, in law enforcement so that uh, those in service reflect those who are in the community, which I think has a direct impact on cultural intelligence. It's, it's a great question. Um, at the end of the day, we should be entirely reflective of the community in race, gender, sexual orientation, all of the various mm -hmm. um, ways we measure population today. Um, we're doing better than we have historically done, but we're still far short of uh, in, in every category. That said, we're far short of recruitment and retention targets in every category as well. So as Vermont continues to face its demographic and workforce challenge that cascades into public safety, not just in law enforcement, but in the fire service with ambulance services closing. Um, and the, it, it's also a great question because it, re, it in part relates to everything we're talking about. The more complicated we make the operating environment, the harder it is to recruit and retain. Mm -hmm. And folks that look at what we do today and we bring them in to, to start training or we bring them in to do ride-alongs, I skipped over my most important point at the beginning of all this, which is if you have not spent a shift in a police car. Mm -hmm. Are you offering? Absolutely. Excellent. Well, that would be so cool. <laughs> it might be cool. <laughs> it might be incredibly boring, or it might be very illuminating. Um, but you, you should do Saturday it. Saturday nights, right? Saturday nights might work. Uh, winter's a little odd because it depends on a lot of different things. But it it will give you a different view of uh, of everything. If you were in the back one with handcuffs with that ball, <laughs> you would you get only partial credit, sir. <laughs> So it, it is related. It's uh, it, a part of the reason that we have to do a better job at engaging communities broadly, but in particular uh, underrepresented communities, is because if they don't trust us, they don't want to be part of the organizations, and then we can't do as good a job at engaging and policing those communities, and it becomes this vicious cycle of um, an inability to uh, one be reflective but then to improve because we when we talk about cultural competency the most important thing we teach folks is we don't know what we don't know mm -hmm. right so it's all related any other questions Thank, thank you. you I promise on most topics it will be a little less scattered but there's so much here that it's hard to keep it for me at least, refined. So thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you.